rose and called you out, a people for his own. One way he has ordained a covering for sinners' shame. A sacrifice was paid for only blood at Only one left his throne. entered in the world, but God so loved the world, he gave to us his only Son, the sacrifice to pay and death to
We were lost, but not forgotten. Desperate, but not alone. In the midst of sinful darkness, heaven spoke and hope was born. The king of heaven came before us, humbly as a man. He was tempted to forfeit his glory, yet his perfection reigned supreme. His love was relentless to forgive the sinner, matchless to restore the sick. His authority tore down the self-righteous and built up the weak. But while his followers praised him, his foes succeeded to crucify him. And on that day, their cry for execution was heaven's echo of redemption. It was the cruelty of our sinfulness that pierced the glory of heaven's holiness. His passion for humanity led him to the pain of the cross. His suffering would be our salvation and his blood would be our forgiveness. While hope seemed to vanish, God's plan had just begun. Fear quenched the courage to follow, but the tomb of this rebel began to quake. Darkness covered the sky, but the light of heaven declared its anthem. Jesus is alive. All realms of iniquity bowed to the King of Kings as he triumphed over death to bring us new life. We are no longer outlaws to his glory, alienated from his grace. We are children of the light, standing empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, He is alive. We're going to start off our service by singing, Behold Our God. Let's join together and sing it. Oh, 
monarchy. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful opening we had. I appreciate uh, everyone putting this together. We had a great opening uh, video there. And behold our God. Uh, I want to thank you for watching our services here at Walnut Creek Baptist Church. And we want to wish all of you a wonderful, wonderful, blessed Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And we're excited about what God is going to do today. And looking forward to this service being the beginning of a new life for all of us. For those that know Christ as their Savior, this is a time to reflect on His wonderful, wonderful majesty, His resurrection, and His power that validated everything He said. And for those that are struggling with salvation, struggling with sin, this is your day today. God bless you. Let's open in prayer together, can we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. And behold our God. And Lord, we ask that you guide and direct every aspect of this service. I pray for those that are watching on various platforms that, Lord, you would speak to each and every person. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. We're going to take an offering right now. And if you're able to give, we have the information on the screen there, our wcbaptist.com. You can go to our app or you can scan the QR code there and take care of it. I appreciate your faithfulness in giving. We have above budget actually since this started, and what a wonderful group of people that are continuing to give in spite of the difficult circumstances. Let's spend a time, let's reflect, and we'll take an offering right now as our group here sings. <laughs> strength for my journey. I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, is this the place where hope abides? Oh 
going to continue our singing this morning with a medley of Easter hymns beginning with Christ the Lord is risen today. Bibles out if you would, if you have them at home, and take them out and turn to the Gospel of John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. And we will be reading from verses 16 through verse 18. John 3 verse 16 through verse 18. The Word of God says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And the Lord will add his blessing to our reading of his holy word this morning. Our pastor is coming in just a moment with this morning's message. Jesus of Nazareth, God's son, sent from heaven to earth to redeem man from sin and separation. But in order to redeem man, he had to become one, the express image of God living among the sons of men. He was tempted, but without sin, perfect. He was fully man, but completely God. you've enjoyed our service so far, and if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter number three. Hope is alive. This day which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't some cultural holiday that we look at. It's not something that, uh, even though that's not necessarily wrong, where we dress up and have a spring festival. This is a day, ladies and gentlemen, now listen to me, where hope is alive. I want you to look at John chapter 3, verse number 16. A verse that many of you have heard, many of you have uh, memorized and understood for a long time. The Gospel writer, the Apostle John writes, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that's His one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Hope, hope, but have everlasting life that you get at the time of salvation. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But listen to this now. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want to preach a message I've simply titled this morning, Hope is alive. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Easter Sunday. And Lord, as we have literally maybe hundreds watching on various platforms, in their living rooms, in their kitchens, and on their cell phones, and their iPads, and their flat screens. Lord, let this be a day of worship. Let this be a day of understanding that hope is alive because of the resurrection. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct my words and let them be the words of grace and truth and hope. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. What's well, because of what we celebrate today, we have hope. We have the knowledge that because of God's love, we have eternal destiny in heaven for those that have received Christ. We know that our present circumstances are not the final conclusion. We know that because we've been, some of us cast aside, we are loved by God. We know that our physical pains will one day be gone and we will be restored. We know that others may have abandoned us, but God will never leave us nor forsake us. 
We know that just because we are not part of what we call the in crowd, that God still loves us and will allow us into his kingdom. We know that the world is unfair and cruel, but God is just and living. And loving, rather. Ladies and gentlemen, we know all these because the tomb was empty. The Bible and Jesus' words were validated and became true because he rose from the dead. No resurrection, then Christ was a liar or lunatic that preached and taught things that were not true. But because of the resurrection, it made and validated everything he said became true. We have hope. We have hope because our sins can be forgiven. We have hope because the God-man died and rose again. I want you to turn, if you have your Bibles, to the book of Mark. Mark, just for a moment. I want you to look at something that will encourage us. Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter 16. It says there in verse number 6. Mark 16, 6. Again, we're looking at that Easter morning. The morning in which it became very evident that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. It says in verse number 6, And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. And these are the disciples and some of Mary Magdalene and others that had gone to the tomb. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way and tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. And there you shall see him as he said unto you. Now look what they did. The joy and the excitement. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said anything to any man, for they were afraid. What a day! And that's the hope that we have today. So hope is alive. We want to look this morning because of three areas I want to look at. First, we're going to look at why Jesus Christ had to be the perfect sacrifice in order for hope to be alive. And I want to look at that just for a moment. For Hope is alive because of, number one, the perfection of Christ. Jesus Christ was perfect. He was the God-man. He was the Lamb of God without sin. And that had to be the case for him, his crucifixion and his resurrection to forgive us of our sins. If you go to the book of Hebrews, I want to read a, a few verses, not all 14. And I want to give you a little bit of the background why this is important. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the Bible, this will give you a little bit of understanding of why Jesus Christ had to be the Son of God. The perfection of Christ. He was all man and all God. As it said in the opening video, He was tempted as we were without sin. It says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 1, let's just look at that just for a moment. Then verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now that was originally what we're talking about, the tabernacle, which label later would be the temple in Jerusalem. This is where the sacrifices were done. And, the, and verse number two. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was a candlestick, and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, this would be the area that would be let, they would, the area of where they would leave the ministry or the working of the temple and the sacrifices, they would go through the second veil only once a year, the great high priest, one day, the Day of Atonement, to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for the forgiveness of the, for the sins of the people of Israel and the nation, excuse me, the nation of Israel. This would be done once a year and had to be done over and over and over and over again. And it says in verse number 3, And after the second veil, the tabernacle was called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, 
And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of the glory, shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot speak particularly. Now when these things were, now excuse me, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle for the service of God. That was the very first area that we referenced. But the second, with the high priest alone, once a year, not without blood. In other words, he brought a sacrifice, which he offered himself and for the heirs of the people. So what we see here is we have hope because the perfection of Christ was the perfection of Christ allowed that to be complete. We have hope because the perfection of Christ, he was sinless. He was a sacrifice that required to forgive the sins of mankind. After his sacrifice, it was never or would not be required again, according to Hebrews 9. It was finished. It was done. And we'll reference that in a minute. It reminds me. So what we have here is the priest. Every year on the Day of Atonement, every year he would go into what we call the Holy of Holies, into, into the temple and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant so the people's sins would be redeemed or forgiven. That would have to be done over and over and over again. But it was finished when Christ died on Calvary. It's like this, and I'll explain a little bit uh, in detail in just a moment. When I went to Auburn University, I worked and it was a five-year, very hard engineering degree. It was incredibly difficult for me. And when I won and I got my diploma, I got my diploma, all my school bills have been paid, and I opened it up and it said, you know, Fred J. Ayers Jr., Bachelor of Civil Engineering. And I said, it's finished, it's done. I don't have to go back. I don't have to retake classes over and over and over again. It is finished. Here's the paper. I don't have to go back. And what we see is when we find the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary, when we see Jesus Christ dying on the cross, it is finished. The sacrifice once and for all was done for mankind. We find in the reference here, the first veil in, in Hebrews 9.2 was the, where we see the candlestick and the table and the sanctuary. And they would go into that area. When it was time, the priests always went into the first tabernacle, and that's where they accomplished the work of God, the work of the temple. And then they would go, according to Hebrews 9, chapter 3, the second veil, which was called the holiest of holies, in which it had a golden censer and the ark and the covenant, and the, and the golden pot, which had the men and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And the second veil was entered by the high priest alone, once a year he brought blood which he offered for himself and for the heirs of his people, according to Hebrews 9, 7. But according to Hebrews 9, 8, the holiest of all was not, the holiest of all was not yet declared. It means that only the high priest could enter in prior to that. But when Christ died on the cross, he tore that veil from the top to the bottom, according to Hebrews 9:11. And Christ was the high priest, and his sacrifice was completed. So Christ fulfilled the obligation of the sacrifice by shedding his blood so we could have the opportunity of eternal life. Now I want to say this. If you don't understand all this, here's what you need to understand. That Christ was perfect. He was the final sacrifice that had to be given. And because he was all God and all man, you can have redemption, you can have salvation because of what the God-man did on the cross. He was perfect, the perfection of Christ. He did this one time and one time only. It was not to be repeated according to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 or 25. Verses 24 and 25. Otherwise, it would have to be done all and over again but Christ would have been doing it since the foundation of the world until today. It's finished. He 
Hebrews 10, 12 says this, but this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God. What man in Hebrews 10, 12? Well, that man is Jesus Christ. His offering was complete because he was perfect. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering hath he perfected forever to them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, 12, 17 says this, And their sins and iniquities because of this, God says, I will remember no more. So God will not remember your sins if you've asked him to come into your life and save you for your sin, from your sins. To be perfect, he would have to be the son of God without error. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he, made, for he hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but in all points, was, in all points tempted like as we are, but yet, look what it says, without sin. 1 Peter 2.22 says, Who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me and listen to me this morning. Jesus Christ was perfect. He fulfilled the obligations of the perfect sacrifice so you and I can have eternal life in heaven. Hope is alive because of it. Christ's perfection satisfied all the requirements for a perfect sacrifice. Hope is alive because of what we just heard. Praise God for that. Now let me just say something to you. When I became a Christian, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I didn't understand all the temple sacrifices. I did not understand all of the first five books of the Bible. I did not understand all of the various feasts in the Old Testament, which are very important, by the way. But I did know this. That Christ died for my sins. He was the sacrifice, the Lamb of God. And I asked him to come into my life at 28 years of age. So hope is alive, number two, because of the love of Christ. Now go back to our text. I want you to go back to John chapter 3. Go back to John chapter 3, verse number 16. Because of the love of Christ. God's love. God's love. We find here in John 3.16, the greatest love verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave, you understand now his son, who he is? His only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave. What a love story. It says in John 15, 13, says this, Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God's love. God's love is the only love that will never falters. God's love is the only love that will never fail. Take comfort in your faith. And God truly loves you, and he loves you forever. God's love. 1 John 4, 7 says this, Behold, let us love one another, for the love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. What is love? Love is God reaching down to mankind, and speaking like He is to some of you right now, and says, I want you to be a part of my family. The perfect Son, the God-man, was given and sacrifice so you can have eternal life with me and your sins forgiven. You don't have to spend an eternity in a devil's hell. And God says, because I love you, I gave my son for you. Take comfort in that. As it says in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Romans 5, 8, a, a verse that we know. 
It says, but God commended His love toward us and, yet, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you hated God, while you despised God, while you ignored God, while you were just casual towards who God and Jesus Christ is, God said, I love you now. While we were yet sinners. God showed His love by sending His Son to die for us. While we were enemies against Jesus Christ, He died for us. While I was sinning against God, God is still calling me. While I was away from God, He still loved me and calling. While I was cursing and fighting God and ignoring God, He is calling well, I was hated by others. God is calling me a friend. While the world laughs and scorns, God is loving. As the world turns against me, God is loving me. He loves me because I am an outcast. He loves me because I'm hurting. He loves me because I'm disenfranchised. He loves those who are sitting in the cancer ward this morning. He loves mankind and He gave His Son so your sins can be forgiven and you can spend eternity with Him. I want you to turn to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter number 8 is probably one of the greatest love verses of Christ in the Bible. Romans chapter 8, please. I want you to look at verse number 37. You know, we, we find it easy to love those that love us. There's certain people in my life that are very easy to be around and, and to like because we have a mutual respect for each other and, and we, we, we're friends. We, we hang out. We have certain characteristics about our lives, certain hobbies or we like certain sports teams, and we like to hang around. We, we, we have no problem with them. But then there's others sometimes that really bother you. Now, I want you to think about somebody that bothers you right now. Well, think of that and multiply it times affinity because you, before you accepted Christ, hated God. But look here, he still loved you. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 37. Paul writes, Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now look at God's love. It's an everlasting love. It's a continual love. It says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. That means everything past, everything present, and everything in the future. That includes it all. And if that didn't cover it all, next, the next verse does. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. This Easter Sunday, hope is alive because of God's love for you and for me. He cared for me. When I didn't care for him, he loved me. And this is the day to recognize his love because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The God-man rose from the dead and he has got your name stamped on, his, on the scars on his hand. Hope is alive because I am a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses uh, 2 Corinthians 5:17 says if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away. That life that you have maybe been ashamed of it doesn't mean that the scars of your past are going away, but God heals your heart and you become somebody new. Behold, all things are become new, Paul says. 
You have an opportunity this morning to be a new creature. Think about that. My sins have been forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says this. This is written to Christians now. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God has forgiven you of all your past, present, and future sins if you're one of his children. You're somebody new. Often, we equate this verse with somebody that had a, and let me use the word, a checkered past. They had a life that was very, very evident they hated God. Or maybe they were in some fleshly sinful activities and we see there's a line drawn in the sand and, and from this point they receive Christ and there's a brightness and a countenance and, and a new life in Christ. And look here, praise God for those people. But for many, it was a casualness. Maybe you weren't in some type of activity that even the culture would say is bad, but you're still away from God. You're still not a Christian. And because if you accept Christ as your Savior, it says you're a new creature in Christ. Somebody new. See, we, we find this in the medical world today. If you travel and maybe go up to one of our local hospitals here and you go to the floor where they have those that are of stage four cancer or those that are destined to be uh, not to live very long. They, you tell them, you walk onto that floor and you knock on the door and you may say to somebody, hey, listen, I understand you have stage four cancer and I, I met your family outside the door and I'm praying for you, but let me tell you something. And maybe a doctor would say this, there's hope because there's one more treatment we can do. You see them light up like a candle. You've heard me. Because there's one more thing that may allow life. Let me tell you this. This is much better than that. Because you can be a new creature, a new man, and a new woman because of what Jesus Christ did on this day. There's real hope. God can forgive and cure your sin and allow you to be with him forever. In New York City, if you've ever gone there, there's a national, I think it's a monument, it's actually a park. It's called Ellis Island, New York. There are Im immigrants during the late 1800s and early 1900s left the poverty and despair and lack of opportunities in Europe primarily to come to America for a new life and hope. The Statue of Liberty was the beacon that called many to cross over the Atlantic Ocean. And they were going there because when we get to the United States of America, we've been told there's hope, there's a new life, there's opportunities, and they came by the tens of thousands, thousands and millions. Because of the empty tomb, we have something better than that. Because Christ arose from the dead, it validated everything he said and says, what I said is true, there is hope. After he was placed in the tomb, all hope was gone. But on the third day, hope became alive because he rose from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to risk your life crossing the Atlantic Ocean like our, some of our ancestors did to find opportunity and hope in America. The hope we're talking about is found in Christ Jesus and you don't have to risk your life or do a bunch of good deeds to get it. All you have to do is accept the hope given by the risen Savior. It's not a religion. It's not being a Catholic, a Baptist, a Methodist, or a heathen. It's understanding who Jesus Christ is and calling unto him to save you from your sins. And I know right now watching, there are people that are struggling big time with that right now. Accept the hope that is given. All you have to do is confess your sins and cry unto God for this hope. Turn to John chapter 3, verse number 36. John 3, 36.
At the end of this discourse, John writes, closes this chapter with the following statement. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's what I've been talking about. He that believeth not, that's the alternative. The Son of God, he that believeth not the Son of Son shall not see life, and the wrath of God abideth on him. There's a consequence for rejecting his love. There's a consequence for rejecting the Jesus that cried under mankind that hated him. And that consequence is your sins will not be forgiven and you'll spend an eternity in hell. He's calling unto you right now. He's calling. See, in 1988, I got that hope. I came to the realization in 1988 as a young father with two small children that I was a sinner and I needed my sins to be forgiven. And there was a point where God spoke to me and God's divine sovereignty, it was on Memorial Day, 1988, on my couch watching the 11 o'clock news, I was convicted of my sins as I saw the crosses at Normandy. And I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, come into my life and save me from my sins. That's when I became a new creature. And I'm praying today that will be the same for you as well. See, many of us, I'll use my hand, a very simple illustration. This iPad represents sin. And when we have our sin, a God's up here, and all he can see is your sin. But Jesus Christ came perfectly clean and white as snow, and he takes all your sin, and look how he leaves you. Sinless. So how can you have this eternal life? Number one, you need to realize you're a sinner. Sin is defined as violating the doctrines and decrees of the Bible, but you're a sinner. Have you ever stolen? Have you ever lied? you ever cheated? Then you're qualified. You're a sinner. The Bible says we're born into sin. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you have any desire to get right with God, you must understand that you're a sinner. Without understanding you're a sinner, then there is no hope for you. But understanding you're a sinner, which I'm 99.9% .9 of you understand, yes, I have sinned. I had to come to that conclusion. Number two, you must have to realize, I believe there's a price to be paid for your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word wages, it's what you've earned. The Bible says clearly because of our sin nature, we have earned death and separation from God forever in a place called hell. That's the wages. The wages of sin is death. The, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, I can't preach this to you. I can't beat on a pulpit. I can't do anything, but God is speaking to you right now and it makes no sense to your family and your friends, but you want to call unto God right now, like I did. Number three, you must realize that Christ has already paid the price for your sins. That was this whole message. He died on the cross for you. But God commended his love toward us that while yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. While you were at war with God and I was at war with God, Christ died for me and for you, and in his sovereignty, and his love, and his calling, his calling to you now, he's saying, come unto me. All ye who labor and are heavy hearted, heavy hearted, I will give you rest. And lastly, a sin, excuse me, a prayer doesn't save you, crawling unto God does. Yes, you call unto Jesus Christ through a prayer. I did. But just saying words is meaningless. 
going through some one, two, three, four steps. That's not what God wants. God wants a person that says, I know I'm a sinner and I'm calling to you to save me. That's how I'm closing this service. I'm going to ask you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want us all to bow our heads right now. If you're a Christian, could you pray for your own life? Thank God for your salvation. And if you're not a Christian, or you're not sure of your salvation, the prayer that I'm going to give you, it's not the words, it's not the order, it's the conviction of sin and calling unto Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand all the temple sacrifices and the inner veil and the outer veil. But you do understand that Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice for your sin. Dear Jesus, for those of you who are concerned about your salvation, can we pray? I know that I'm a sinner. And if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. That's many of us that are watching. But I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life and into my heart and save me. For those watching that have a time in your life and you've accepted Christ, and for those who prayed that prayer, why don't we spend just a moment in silent prayer before I close. as the piano plays. Amen. Everybody look here. Everybody look here. God is good, and we thank the Lord for your being here today. And I have a brief video I want to show as we close this service. I think it summarizes what I've spoken of or spoken about. And then after that, there's some information. And if you would like us to contact you or like to contact us, there's some information on this. But we're glad that you're here, glad you had the opportunity. I want you to watch this closing little video. God bless you. Thank you for watching this morning. And if you can pass this on to others, that will be a real blessing. Let's watch this video right now. When Jesus took his last breath on that cross, he cried, it is finished. The sin of humanity would now be forgiven because of the shedding of his blood. But who would believe him? Who would believe that Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Son of God? He was dead. After the crucifixion, they buried his body in a tomb. And for three days, hope was dead. For three days, his followers hid in fear, trembling in silence.
But on the third day, something miraculous happened. Hope came to life. Thank you. 